um, great to be here. I'm sorry uh, to be here virtually, but um, uh, I think actually I have COVID. I'm probably going to test later today, or maybe I won't. But I did lose my taste last night, so I'm kind of just hanging in there. So, um, what the, uh, it, it, as Paul said, um, this is really exciting. This was uh, one of those uh, things that I had used uh, D-Trax, the previous product, before to solve uh, uh, cervical non-unions, and then it was pulled off the market because all the insurance companies didn't like it, and they came up with this study. And at first, I thought, oh, this is crazy. You're going to flip everybody and randomize? But here we go. Um, this is, um, uh, I think, really challenging a paradigm. These are my disclosures. Um, so what are the challenges of multi-level ACDF? Well, obviously, ACDF is sort of the standard uh, uh, for these types of pathology. Um, and But there's markedly higher uh, non-union rates. And despite every surgeon I'm running into personally saying, all my three levels do great, um, when you look at the data, it's a little bit different. Uh, there's also increased adverse events and revision surgeries um, when uh, we do these uh, longer uh, uh, constructs. So, you know, can supplementing these really be advantageous? Well, we know there's a long list of RCTs looking at one and two levels, and uh, I've been a part of the, Paul has, and uh, uh, so has Andrew, you know, we, of these studies. And, and, and the data is really good at one and two levels, but you can't take that data and then uh, extrapolate it on three and four levels. It's just not good science. There's really no RCTs completed yet, uh, well, except ours, uh, for uh, how we do with these long level and multi-level constructs. And you, know, you have to ask the question, how much worse is adding the three, third level to an ACDF? Well, it's quite a bit when you look at the data. And there's a large number of retrospective studies. Now, this is an unofficial review, but essentially we did a literature review. We ought to write this up. But um, when you look at one and two levels, obviously the, the fusion rates are high. And then, of course, the, the other question is, is how many are sy symptomatic? Well, uh, that's, that's, a, that's another topic. But obviously, the, the, the higher number of non-unions, likely the more symptomatic patients there will be. But as you go to three and four levels, you start approaching um, uh, fusion rates that fall below 50%. And multiple studies have shown that you know, the, the worst is uh, uh, Baker in 2022 uh, published 24% uh, revision rates uh, for, for, for these uh, problems. Now, also, you have to ask yourself, well, what's the, if you improve the stability, does, does, it, does it really do that? And so certainly stabilization posteriorly does that from a biomechanics standpoint. But when you look at it as far as revisions, um, if you do posterior versus anterior and you're at 74 74% versus 40% for circumferential and anterior. So you have a much less likely chance of revisions if you do a circumferential um, uh, uh, surgery. Now, despite this improved stability, it's kind of interesting. This is an old paper, but it just shows the disparity between doing circumferential fusions and uh, doing ACDF. Now, again, morbidity and things like that. But before, all we had was a big open incision, open procedure, um, and uh, lateral mass screws and all of that, which uh, is completely different than what we're talking about with this minimally invasive technique. And also long surgeries and high rates of short-term complications are seen. So obviously, uh, when you're doing these longer surgeries, uh, people are in the hospital uh, longer. But again, this is the old technique. Well, one of the things we looked at is the biomechanical stability of chorus. And when you look at that compared to lateral mass screws, it's very similar. In fact, it's statistically not dissimilar. And Kramer published in 2020 on 35 patients that showed that there was uh, minimal blood loss and that there were no reoperations or revisions. So um, a lot of this prompted this, uh, this study. And so here's the study. Um, the, we wanted to look at the differences in outcomes, 12 and 24 months uh, results, and see what our final outcomes would be. Uh, a couple of the authors are 
uh, employees of Providence Medical, the rest of us did receive institutional report or support and also consulting fees for things like this. Um, study design was uh, a multi-center prospective study. It was in 19 sites, as you see across the United States. There were a total of 227 adults with symptomatic three-level degenerative disc disease. Uh, Bayesian analysis was uh, used to determine the um, uh, the exit. The object was to look at safety and efficacy and also look at outcomes. So the methods were a standard Smith-Robinson approach. You could use a semi-constrained anterior plate. You needed to use a structural machined allograph no spacer, no uh, cages, and you could not use any other kind of biologic or synthetic grafts. The circumferential treatment was the same ACDF procedure, plus adding posterior cervical fusion using the chorus device system at uh, the same levels. Now, with this tissue sparing uh, technique, the guide tube is directed, as you can see here, at each uh, individual level. And this can be done through a, a fairly uh, small uh, incision. Um, and you just direct up to the levels that you need to go. And then from an AP view, you want to really go inside out in an oblique fashion. And so a midline incision is perfect for this. Some people prefer two incisions which was originally taught, now I do a single incision on all my patients, whether they're one or multiple levels. So the primary and secondary outcomes, the first was composite fusion success at 12 months. Wanted to see bridging bone across the inner body space, segmental motion less than two degrees and radiographic outcomes were dependent by uh, an independent lab. And at 24 months, we wanted to look at composite safety success, fusion success, NDI improvement, uh, maintenance of improvement, no neurological uh, decrease, and um, also freedom from surgical revisions. The inclusion criteria for patients 18 to 80. Exclusion was osteoporosis, prior surgery at index levels, age beyond the inclusion, and a baseline NDI of less than 15 out of 50. The real world patients is really what this study is about. We tried not to, as many ID studies that we've all been involved with, limit people. For example, obesity was allowed. Our average BMI was 31. History of tobacco use was allowed. And we had 15 to 70% of patients with that. Low density, as in osteopenia, was allowed. So these are really the patients that were treating. They weren't cherry picked. When you look at the background characteristics, they were all similar between the two groups. There were crossovers allowed at 12 months, and they had to be performed within 60 days. When we looked at the results of the fusion rates, this is where it really gets interesting. Circumferential at 12 months was 61%, whereas ACDF was 16.7. So before you start screaming and pull your hair out, which I can't hear remotely, yes, that did improve to 33%, versus 74% at 24 months. So still a huge difference. But where the rubber meets the road and where we're dealing with patients every day is this statistic. The revision rates at 24 months for 1.7%, one out of 59 patients had a revision surgery with circumferential vision versus 13 out of 57. That's huge. Think of your practice, think how many of these you do a year and think how many more revisions you're going to have to do on patients. This is this is huge. I think this is one of probably the most telling tales of, of this data that we have to show. Safety and efficacy, again, didn't expect this per se, but uh, was statistically significantly better with circumferential fusion, fusion versus uh, adverse events uh, as well. And so the estimated blood loss was also interesting. Only 10 cc's difference. You would think that might be a big difference. Procedure time was a significant difference at 98 plus minutes. I will tell you with my workflow, that's probably I realistically uh, 50 to 65 minutes in my OR. Uh, but if you're not as efficient, yeah, the flip and the positioning and all of that 
can add some time. Length of stay was one night uh, for both groups and was not statistically dissimilar. So in conclusion, there this three-level standalone has lower fusion rates, very, very statistically significant, higher revision rates. But when you supplement ACDF with posterior fusion, it significantly improves the fusion rates. It significantly reduces revision rates. And these benefits are achieved without increasing risk of surgical complications or prolonging hospital stay, unlike previous circumferential fusion techniques. And the added surgical time and blood loss for the posterior procedure was modest and is perfectly justified by the improved outcomes and decreased revision rates. Thanks. Hey Pierce, uh, really, uh, first of all, I uh, hope that you're feeling better soon and thank you so much uh, that you still made it into your airplane, it seems like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I uh, really enjoyed the talk. A quick question for you. The fusion rates are obviously, you know, like telling <laughs> amazing and I think, you know, speak uh, for themselves. Uh, my question was, did you guys measure the doses of the construct? Did it sort of, was there any change in sort of, uh, you know, like configuration of the final product? Or, or was the low doses maintained, you know, because it's always been a concern of us, you know, when you kind of like, you know, put spaces in there. Um, did you guys look at that? That is a great question. Um, anecdotally, I will say I didn't see any uh, issue with that, but I definitely think that's that's a great paper that we can easily do with Spine Camp and um, probably, uh, probably get that published out. Uh, and again, comparing that to to to, to outcomes, but yes, um, very very good question. But but I will just tell you anecdotally, I don't I, I don't I don't see that in my post ops. Uh, <clears throat> great talk, Pierce. Uh, you know, I had a couple comments and questions. Like, one is a technical issue. So uh, you know, I, I know uh, where in your neck of the woods, you know, obesity is an issue, and sometimes when you know you're prone a patient, I look and I can see C two. Uh, maybe C3 sometimes. So, like, so let's say you have a five, six, six, seven, maybe seven, one. I, I'm not sure you use it at, at that level. Like, how do you do it safely? Because you you can't image them laterally. AP is fine, obviously, but laterally is a challenge. That's a very good question, Paul. I will tell you that um, uh, part of it is looking at them preoperatively. The other is just technique and positioning. Um, I have aborted on one patient that I just couldn't see, and it wasn't, uh, it, I didn't feel it was safe to proceed. Now, um, part of it is the roles, the way we uh, place them, and then you want to get the shoulder straps, make sure that they're long enough to get the shoulders down, and you do that before you wrap the patient. So before you wrap all the sheets over the patient. You want to get their shoulders down as much as you can. And then we'll put tape in two different ways. So we will strap them, tape them, and um, uh, and then get them in position. I don't use tongs. This is the only posterior cervical I don't use tongs on, but um, I, even a neuroforaminotomy, I use tongs. But uh, I don't. I don't for this. And Again, I, I did a board on one uh, six seven level that I just I just couldn't see. I have done uh, a couple seven ones, uh, but those are the real skinny patients you know you can see. But that is challenging. You have to be prepared to abort um, if you can't. But I will tell you with the techniques that I've learned, and maybe we need to kind of get that out as a white paper um, with some uh, w w with some images, et cetera. Um, I've gone to where I can I can see. Uh, most of the time. The other issue is not so technical is, you know, I think everybody's aware like multi-level, um, any fusion has a decreased fusion rate, but the numbers you report is shockingly low. I, I would say 20, 20 some odd percent. And you could argue like we don't get CT, so we don't really know. Um, so a couple of components of that is one, is it clinically relevant sometimes? Because we do three level ACDF and, you know, we'll get some x-rays, they look fine. And sometimes we see them past year, sometimes we don't. If they're doing fine, we don't. So, so one is clinical relevance. And the other is, you know, 
if you're doing this with three levels, maybe four levels, I, I mean, where do you draw the line? I mean, should you do them on two levels or even one level? I, I, I guess that's maybe, you know, a, you know, a difficult answer, but, uh, you know, I, I think no, no, I think are doing that. Yeah, there's a watershed zone between one and two levels that uh, when you jump to three and four, I mean, just think about it. If you go in for a one or two level ACDF, you're you're hopping into the OR, no big deal. As soon as it becomes a three level, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more. It's not the same. I mean, I group one and two levels essentially in the same group. I group three and four levels into another group just on how my approach is going to be, how my exposure is going to be, everything. And so I think that changes. So, so one and two levels, I don't really see this being an issue except for, um, let's say you have a three level ACDF and now you got a three, four level you're doing and you don't want to take the plate off. That one I do flip. I'll put a standalone cage in front, which does not have a great fusion history um, uh, by itself above a multi-level fusion, but I'll flip them and do a chorus on those. Okay, so that's that's a one level I'll do. But all my three and four levels now are, are done uh, circumferentially if we can get them approved. It's just, it's what I would do. I mean, honestly, it's if I had to have that surgery, I hope I don't, if I did, I would say flip me and somebody who's good at putting these things in, put them in. Because, you know, you talk about the, the, the other thing you talked about was uh, uh, clinical outcomes. And we have more data that we're going to show as we finalize the two-year uh, outcomes. Uh, but the fact of revision rates, that's symptomatic patients. We're not taking them back because they happen to have a pseudoarthrosis. We're taking them back because they're symptomatic. And so when you look at the difference of one versus 19 patients of, of 50 some, that's huge. Hey, um, I have one more other question. Um, you know, the CT scan at the end that you showed was really uh, impressive. Um, I just was wondering what biologics do you use in the back or is it just a graft? DBM, uh, in, any kind of DBM all allograft is, is fine. And what's interesting is, and I didn't really go into it because you can't show everything, is that the majority of our post-op CTs show flowing bone over the lateral masses. I mean, it's impressive. So when people say, well, you're not getting a proper posterior fusion, that's absolutely not the case. Now, again, not every case, but almost all of them show this nice flowing bone uh, over the top of the implant. Great, Pierce. Thanks. I mean, very, very forgotten. Hey, is that your real cockpit in the background? I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, that's uh, that's the TBM 960 heading to Phoenix a few months ago, and that's the sunset in the background. And this is my view from the cockpit. Yeah, I, I mean, it's very fancy. <laughs> Thanks, Pierce.